Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, first of all, let me thank the Young Hormone India team, which is the future of India, thank for you, uh, giving me opportunity to deliberate on a very important topic. And I am really uh, feeling elated that our youngsters, our students have taken such a big initiative and make a, made a very rapid progress in geometrical progression rather. And they are doing very well in academics and I wish them best of luck. So I have been asked to deliberate on patterns of steroid replacement on adrenal insufficiency. Uh, start. So pattern of replacement in primary adrenal insufficiency as the topic is, why I'll start with uh, what adrenal insufficiency is. I am sure that it must have been already deliberated. We know there is an endocrine disorder where adrenal glands primarily fail, uh, whether it is disease in adrenal glands or it is outside in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The disease, although is relatively rare, occurs in 5 million, 5 per million per year with a prevalence of 35 to 60 cases per million. The disease is life-threatening with a two-year mortality of uh, more than 80%. And although the disease is autoimmune of autoimmune origin in the West. Now, in Indian setting, there may be some differences. So if we see that it was Thomas Edison who is credited with description of adrenal inception in 1855, there have been many scientists uh, who have actually contributed. But the name comes from Thomas Edison's description. There have been Dr. Kendall, Rickenstein, Hank, and so many people who have got Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for describing various aspects of adrenal physiology and the hormones. So if we see adrenal inception, it can be a primary disease in adrenal glands. And uh, of course, uh, when the feedback is lost, you will have elevated ACTH and CRH, the cortisol, secretion will be low. But when the disease in adrenal gland is understandably, we will have low mineral and androgen, uh, androgens also. But if the disease is in the pituitary, where the ACTH will be deficient, then probably the mineral and adrenal component is preserved. And in that case, the local hydrogen potassium pump and the uh, aldosterone loop remains intact and they will not have mineral corticoid deficiency severely. And similarly, in tertiary or what we can say hypothalamic diseases, we will have cortisol low, but you will have mineral corticoid preserved. So accordingly, uh, we can have several causes which can cause adrenal insufficiency. They could be acquired or they could be genetic, they could be itrogenic. As Dr. Sunil was saying, itrogenic in India is common because there is rampant unregulated glucocorticoid use in this country. But the commonest cause of primary adrenal insufficiency, even though in the West is autoimmune adrenalitis. But we in lower and middle income countries, including India, will have still significant number of cases occurring because of granulomatous diseases like fungal infection, tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, or even metastasis from various cancers, or you can have adrenal hemorrhage or damage of adrenal uh, glands, both glands because of various uh, infections like AIDS, HIV, amyloidosis is very common. So those diseases can, should not be overlooked in our uh, practical scenario. So even though Exogenous glucocorticoid is high in uh, use in uh, India and you will have a stage deficiency and secondary, uh, secondary adrenal insufficiency. But a variety of disorders can impact hypothalamus and pituitary, like they could be again tuberculosis, infection, syphilis, fungal, infiltrative disorders like hemochromatosis, or you can have Sheehan is one of the common conditions in India. You can have pituitary disorders, even trauma. In our setting, we get a lot of road traffic accidents as even we have gunfire uh, shot injuries, those traumatic injuries of brain can also impeach pituitary and you can have secondary adrenal insufficiency. So there are several drugs 
which are incriminated in causing pregnancy adrenal inception see are they are commonly used in our you everybody must be knowing this list so we have to be aware of this Uh, these causes of adrenal efficiency so uh, when adrenal gland or the pituitary or hypothalamus gets affected you will have generally common symptoms of glucocorticoid deficiency however when adrenal gland alone is affected then you may have superadded symptoms of uh, both mineralocorticoid deficiency and some symptoms because of the androgen deficiency so accordingly you will have gut symptoms like nausea vomiting con Patient diarrhea, abdominal pain, anorexia, weakness, headache, hypoglycemia, weight loss, hypertension, and you may have hyperpigmentation in primary adrenal. Hey, you will have some electrolyte disturbances. So this is very common. Everybody knows it. But if you have superadded mineralocorticoid deficiency, then in that case you will have additional. Uh, de uh, risks of dehydration hypotension and you may have androgen deficiency in women for example loss of pubic axillary hair and you may have decrease in libido in women so whatever the causes and whatever the presentation the diagnosis remains a challenge as dr sunil was saying several a battery of tests in endocrinology has been uh, in vogue in practice a uh, dynamic testing like insulin hypoglycemia which is considered to be the gold standard and giving 0.1 to 1.1 unit of insulin per kg and inducing hypoglycemia glucose of less than 40 mg and then checking cortisol remains gold standard but the critic is that it may be too stiff at test which is not normally required for a real life situation in an individual so according to metairopon test glucagon stimulation and other tests have been done so the a uh, the practicable most practicable and easily available and with low risk like unlike that of insulin induced hypoglycemia is standard acetate stimulation test now we know acetate stimulation test is a uh, high dose conventional dose of 250 or 1 microgram low dose which has come into practice now we have a short side lactin test which is in vogue and accordingly there is a sort of this you can see this algorithm which has been proposed uh, to uh, evaluate a patient of adrenal inception see of course a uh, baseline with a glucocorticoid level i will not go in detail of that like if you are unequivocally less than 3.6 microgram uh, of cortisol at baseline you do not need any test it is clear cut adrenal inception see and if you have a baseline more than 18 it is clearly normal then in between levels you need to have a various dynamic tests to uh, take a decision whether it is adrenal inception see or not so endocrine society of us says standard dose So short sinusity test that means 250 microgram in children more than two years or 50 microgram per kg in infants would with a IV IV test with a 30 to 60 milligram cortisol test is good enough. If your cortisol level peaks beyond 20, so you are normal. If it falls short of that. magic mark then you may have adrenal inception see so with one microgram there has been an adequate response however there has been a critique that it may fail in certain situations as i said that it being gold standard people have tried to compare uh, these short sinus with the itt uh, only so uh, a test tetracos Uh, said a tried state which is short sinectin is actually a synthetic acetate versus the porcine acetate which we were using earlier porcine acetate had some issues like antibody response and other issues now it is available in india so we do tetracyclic test and it is uh, uh, done with the uh, which is uh, been shown uh, globally as well as there are some indian studies which i will share with you it is show uh, showing promise in diagnosis and endocrine society us 2016 guideline is also recommend this so there are some 
papers that 30 minute uh, cortisol after this injection may be good enough to make a decision of adrenal inception. See, there are three, three four, in fact, six studies which are supporting this. So uh, there is some data even in India that 250 microgram of uh, the um, cosyntropin will is in Indian patients could match with the Western data. So there are two studies which have been published recently and they have shown that they, this is good enough. So in addition to course, when people use ACTH, if you have more than two-fold rise in ACTH, uh, two-fold rise of ACTH, then normal, upper limit of normal, then we can think that it is a primary gland involvement. So we covered the, uh, the areas that what is the cause of uh, adrenal insufficiency, how do we diagnose, how does it present. Although the main uh, uh, crux of my talk would be replacement of adrenal insufficiency and how, what are the patterns, how, uh, what are the current scenarios of replacement, that is the main thing. Uh, <coughs> glucocorticoid replacement and mineral corticoid. Primary adrenal insufficiency needs both these components. As I said, if you have secondary or tertiary adrenal hyper, uh, hyperfunction, in that case, you may need only glucocorticoid component because mineral corticoid access will remain intact. Now, if we need in adrenal glucocorticoid replacement, the conventional treatment recommended is 15 to 25 milligram of hydrocortisone, uh, which comes at cortisone estate. If we give cortisone estate, which is a prodrug, then it is as 20 to 35 milligrams in adults. And uh, you have to give it in two to three doses. So usually what is done, if you give 10 to 15 milligrams, you give uh, uh, five, five or 7.5 milligram in morning, then in the afternoon you go 2.5 and in late evening you go 2.5 because that is the half-life of the hydrocortisone. But if you have congenital, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, in that case you generally give a little higher dose, 15 to 25, and you try to give the do little higher dose during the night in order to suppress the uh, ACTH. The mineral corticoid component is fludrocortisone. It is given between 0.05 to 0.2 milligram a day. It is, uh, uh, if you give hydrocortisone in higher doses, then that has a mineral corticoid potency. Suppose in case of acute insufficiencies, when you give hydrocortisone, otherwise you need mineral corticoid to be added. Sometimes you give long acting, prednisolone and dexamethasone for glucocorticoid deficiency, but that time mineral corticoid is to be given separately. Now, current glucocorticoid replacement therapy, uh, actually in lower and middle income countries, as I said, when you take a decision of replacement, you may have the cause of adrenal absence, for example, tuberculosis, sarcoid, or any other fungal infection. In that situation, you might have to address the primary disease which is causing adrenal inception. See, so in the process of replacement, we should not forget the addressing the primary disease as well. So replacement um, uh, has to be done with the glucocorticoid, but sometimes for compliance reasons and also for longer suppression or better suppression of adrenal axis like in congenital adrenal hyperplasia, we may choose long-acting glucocorticoids. So uh, I will uh, dedicate two, three slides to what are the issues with long-term glucocorticoid uh, replacements as we also in practice give prednisolone rather than hydrocortisone because hydrocortisone has to be given three times a day. Compliance is usually an issue. The cost is also an issue. So if we give prednisolone or we give dexamethasone in that situation, we have to be very sure of that we don't cause any long-term adverse events of glucocorticoids. For example, you have problems in blood pressure, problems in anthropometry. You may have issues in glucose, lipid metabolism. You have bone health. Uh, issues, you have to do bone density or even bone markers, especially in children, you may have to think of bone morphology, then you may have uh, in growing and adolescent, adolescents and growing children, then you have hypothalamic 
axis should not be suppressed permanently. You should not cause long-term cardiovascular risk, diabetes risk, and eye issues. So in that case, you have to balance out here between the long-term glucocorticoid effects and the compliance. So we have some data on uh, the bone uh, issues, the fracture risk increased by the glucocorticoids here. So the glucocorticoid, long-term glucocorticoids have been actually, the compliance issue has been replaced by converting the hydrocortisone into slow release farms. For example, Takeda, Japan has given this planadin and planadin was actually recommended approved in uh, AI in 2011, FDA also. The main pharmacological principle was that it gives a short, first immediate release preparation and long-term preparation. So you can see how in volunteers it showed that it gives a slow rise. For example, if you compare this curve, the curve B, where we have given three doses of hydrocortisone, and the upper one is the normal curve. So we are trying to mimic that curve. So if you see the planadrin curve, it shows the chronocot or planadrin has shown almost similar to the normal curve. So that means we are trying to mimic the physiological replacement of the glucocorticoid. There is the attempt. So one is daily planadrin. So overcoming the issue of compliance and versus two or twice daily or thrice daily uh, hydrocortisone has shown little better response. So another preparation which is uh, marketed in UK by diurnal company is chronocot. It again has a hydrocortisone layer. It has an inert core inside, then a hydrocortisone layer, then a sustained release layer, and then it has an entry coating. So similarly, if you give that it releases, it has that what is called toothbrush type of regimen. One third of it is released at say 7 a.m. and then two thirds is released by 11 p.m. So that it gives a cover and it has been shown to have a significant effect in non-classical CAH patients. As you can see, it is almost this uh, chronocot, which is the blue line, is almost going with the normal circadian cord cell rhythm, which is the orange line. So that blue line and orange line are almost superimposing each other, means that it has shown a significant uh, advance in the drug delivery system in case of uh, non-classical CAH. Class, even classical CAH as a primary adrenal insufficiency. So uh, the palanadrin and multi uh, particulate uh, uh, um, chronocot preparations, they have both of them have one or the other benefits. One has to be given once and another is to be given twice. So that way both have shown the cortisol curve like normal physiology. So there is a uh, actually clinical trial going on in uh, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia about the chronocot. We expect the results of this trial by January 2025. And this will tell us whether the chronocot actually shows uh, uh, superior benefit to the conventional hydrocortisone in the non-classical CH. So monitoring of long-term glucocorticoid component is a challenge because most of us in clinics show, they show see various parameters like how is their appetite, how is their fatigue level, uh, and we also sometimes check ACTH, but in clinics, ACTH has not proven ben beneficial. Checking cortisol levels are not again beneficial. So what we do in them is uh, a cl clinical assessment of well-being. Now, regarding the uh, mineralocorticoid replacement therapy, the only preparation available is uh, the fludrocortisone because it is a, a synthetic MC9 alpha form of fludro of hydrocortisone, fludrocortisone, and it is a fluorinated uh, molecule. The problem with fludrocortisone is short of life, but it is. It is dosing has an issue. If we give under dosing, it will cause persistent state of hypovolemia, orthostatic hypertension, and persistent tachycardia. That may lead to elevation of urea and potassium levels. So people have tried to see how to monitor 
the medulla corticoid replacement. Uh, electrolytes and renin have been conventionally used. For example, this study showed that renin and electrolytes can indicate medulla corticoid activity and the replacement of the patients on long-term basis in this six-year study. But serum electrolytes have been shown to normalize with lower doses of fludrocortisone. So the problem is when we start small dose initially, electrolytes normalize. Then whether we are underdosing or overdosing, electrolytes cannot tell you. In conventional practice, we ask our residents, we ourselves try to do patient comes adrenaline, we say do electrolytes. But here the most important thing which we forget in clinical practice is that sodium and potassium normalizes even with small dose and it cannot tell us whether we are giving adequate replacement. Now, what is the most important? Between zero to 200 milligrams of fludrocortisone, the electrolytes will not tell us anything. So once we give initial dose, they will normalize, then they will not. And then second thing is plasma renin activity. So plasma renin activity, there is data that it might actually help us in gauging the mineral corticoid. If you can see in this picture, this study showed that sodium normalizes initially, potassium drops initially, and then renin activity correlates well with the level. But the issue with renin levels is that minimum time required is usually two weeks the plasma renin actually mineral corticoid does not have any direct effect on plasma renin activity. It is indirect by changing the vascular volume and blood pressure. So uh, if we have the facility available of plasma renin activity, it is a good marker. But there is a problem with this good marker as well. What is the problem? That when we try to titrate the fludrocortisone dose with renin, the and the upper level when the we go the upper limit of the normal uh, plasma renin uh, activity is highly dependent on sodium intake and therefore it may have a problem that if you, somebody is taking high salt intake then it is not a good predictor second issue with plasma renin activity is that it is significantly varies between the different doses of hydrocortisone, uh, sorry, fluidrocortisone. And data also suggests that mineral corticoid dosing, under dosing, has a little value if we are checking the, uh, uh, the, uh, the if we are checking the uh, adequate replacement. So if we are giving excess dose, it has a little value to differentiate between adequate and excess dose. Here I want to repeat, if I said correctly, that mineral corticoid may actually, if we are giving underdosing of mineral corticoid, plasma renin activity may demonstrate that. So if we are giving overdose, plasma renin activity will not actually make a difference between adequate and overdosing. So the challenge is that if you are giving overdosing of mineral corticoid, plasma renin even cannot help. So what is the answer is atrial natriuretic peptide. There is this one wonderful study. It has shown that uh, in, they have actually compared various doses of uh, mineralocorticoid ranging from 0.2 to 2, uh, sorry, ranging from 0.1 milligram to 0.2. Uh, they have tried to give in different doses and they have seen that if we give ANP levels will be actually uh, uh, in higher dose, in overdose, they will be altered. So in the lower doses, you have mineral corticoid activity if you are giving underdosing. At that time, renin will be a good marker. And if you are overdosing, atrial natriuretic peptide will be a good marker. In other words, they are, these two are complementary to each other. So if you are starting mineral glucocorticoid replacement and mineral corticoid replacement, sodium and potassium initially will be a good marker that you have initiated. Uh, sorry to interrupt, you, sir. you are already three, four minutes uh, over. 
So can yes. you yeah, yeah, I am. I am just concluding. Okay. So, in uh, if you are overdosing, in that case, you have plasma renin activity, and if you are underdosing, in that case, you have atrial nat natriuretic peptide, a good marker. So, I uh, conclude here uh, uh, that primary adrenal insufficiency, although relatively less common, is a very lethal disorder. In India, we should be uh, mindful of the non-autoimmune reasons. And before starting replacement, we should also see the look for the treatment of that condition, which causes adrenal insufficiency. For gauging the adequacy of replacement, we, it is a tricky situation. And glucocorticoid excess can be consequential. As you know, there are a lot of adverse events. So we should have a very good clinical judgment for checking glucocorticoid excess. For mineralocorticoid excess, we have to initially do sodium potassium, but that is not the most important um, situation. So you should actually, if possible, you should gauge renin and atrial neutrotic peptide, uh, complement each other between underdosing and overdosing of mineralocorticoid. Second and last thing is that we have several preparations and several for formulations uh, uh, in um, uh, pipeline which are likely to benefit the patients in future and also give ease of replacement to the clinicians because the compliance may be better with these preparations. Thank you very much.